Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of the Haptics Club podcast. I'm Ashley from Titan Haptics. I'm joined by my Haptics crew. We've got Brian from SenseGov, Eric from Razor, and Manu from Unity. The Haptics Club is a team of people that have a passion for haptics. Our goal is to raise awareness of all the amazing tech and people in the haptic space, and of course, foster discussions, interesting discussions on the topic. Be sure to check out our store, thehapticsclub.com slash shop, where you can get really cool swag. We've got hats, we've got cups, we've got tank tops for summer, which I'm hyped about. And of course, thehapticsclub.com slash blog is our blog. So you can actually read um, all of the podcasts, um, a transcription of um, all the podcasts we have. Check out some of the blog posts from our editors who share all the interesting insights about the haptics industry. But let's let's jump let's jump in. So joining us today is Craig Douglas. He's the CEO and co-founder of Contact CI. Craig and his team have been building multi-force ergonomic haptics for compelling, tangible VR, AR, and telerobotic hands-on interactions. There's so much to talk about. We will dive into a five-minute intro. We will dive into area of expertise, the future of haptics, and of course cover things like challenges and opportunities in the haptics industry. It's an exciting space. Um, be sure to visit the hapticsclub.com, sign up for our newsletter, and of course, like check out our, our, our list of folks that we have upcoming for our next podcast. And last but not least, um, wouldn't have things like our website and Rockstar and coffee and things um, without people like the Haptics Industry Forum who sponsor us. They are an amazing organization that want to streamline haptics adoption, foster collaboration, and increase market awareness. So thank you to the Haptics Industry Forum. But enough of me in this intro. Let's talk about haptics. Manu, I'll hand it to you, my friend. Thank you, Ash. That was a great intro. Um, Craig, happy to have you with us. I'm going to start you off with a very cool question. Can you provide us with a brief background on your journey and how you became involved in the field of haptic tech and human computer interfaces in general? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, before I guess jumping in, I want to do the obligatory, but not obligatory because I genuinely mean it. That excited to be here. I appreciate the opportunity, and you know, the, the you know, uh, genuinely, you know, through the the forum, but also through like the newsletter. Ashley just mentioned this podcast, the blog you guys are doing. It's been really exciting to see the momentum that this group has particularly brought to awareness of haptics as a whole. So, I mean, uh, you know, there's a there's a need for people to have distribution along with product. Uh, so really appreciate all the work that you guys have been putting in the ground requires for people to even know that there's distribution possible for haptics. So you know, thank, thank you. you on all that. Um, in terms of, I guess, answering the question of where my journey comes in, um, I'll start with um, a little bit of my my background growing up and then, you know, kind of going in more from, you know, there as a whole. Um, I had the unique opportunity that my entire drive to, to school for high school was just going around an amusement park. So, you know, the in my every night at 10, 10 p.m., there was fireworks show going on in the backyard. There was, you know, a massive amount of amusement and amazement and magic that kind of happened just from the fact that I just assumed that every kid had a giant amusement park as their backyard. Um, and then from that, my family was obviously amusement park, roller coaster kind of experiential, get immersed in things kind of family. We went to the Disney parks in the 90s, and um, there was the many of you are familiar with Disney Quest, probably. Um, it was their downtown uh, kind of arcade experimental place that they, you know, were some of the leading VR stuff that was even happening at all in the 90s that together was their um, Aladdin ride that basically had like a 20 pound headset attached to the roof, right? And uh, you're sitting in something, and me as a little 10 year old, I really felt like I was riding along the carpet with Aladdin going through that or. And, wow. um, you know, in the projection mapped room, I really felt like I was in Pirates of the Caribbean grabbing onto the multimodal like, you know, cannon that allowed me to be shooting at it. But it's a projection mapped interaction, you know, as a whole. So it was those kind of experiences that plus having a father who his job was selling audiovisual equipment. So, you know, every day was new projectors in our houses, things, the household, things like that. And um, when I was growing up in the church, I was, you know, sitting back at uh the audiovisual table running the soundboard with my dad during service the whole time. You're kind of just being exposed to how there are new cutting ways to tell a story also. So just kind of each of these things being a thread and how I was being raised. Um, and then there comes, you know, what I call the Oculus Awakening era of consumer VR, right? You know, obviously, you know, even just referencing JPL or Disney, there was a lot going on in the 90s or even before or everything like that. Oculus brought like the first time for consumer technologies to really be able to layer it all together. I happened to be lucky enough to be an undergrad this time. Um, I would consider a lot of my life background and and to be in the you know entrepreneurial space as a whole, trying to find where's a place I can make my impact, um, but also wanting to be able to like 
you know, provide good for everyone out there, uh, you know, in that impact specifically, what is actually worthwhile to be doing. Um, and at that time, I did, uh, again, we're an undergrad, the Oculus Awakening era, did an Apollo 11 experience in the DK2 uh, at our Syracuse University lab that Buzz Aldrin had, you know, done some PR about tearing up in and feeling like it was truly the first time he was going back to space. Um, in that experience, I'm going to grab a... Yeah. Like a, just a, a, a prop, I guess. Um, there was... A pencil that went floating by right at the moment that gravity clicked off, right? Everything was designed around the, the mode of the Xbox controller interaction. No interactions from there, from your hands being tracked or anything, right? DK2 era. We're not, we're not, we don't, we don't read off movements going. Um, and the pencil reaches out and I flip, reach out to flick it. And in that moment, I had had all of the immersion broken. Uh, I had had all of the magic of feeling like I was back on that Aladdin ride, um, being like able to be like, okay, it's really here, it's coming. All the while, I had you know my co-founder uh, Tim Meyer, uh, as well as uh, Tom Buchanan, and um, working from some prototypes that they had started putting together on looking at. There's a way that we could actually start tracking the hand in a space that hasn't happened yet. What is a way that like could be brought in differently? Each time they had really talked to me about it so far, I was like, eh, I don't know. But that was the moment that like fully, I was like, nope, the spatial computing itself can't exist until we have the hand in there equally to the eyes and the ears at that full potential of what I've wanted since, again, that childhood of going on the roller coasters and wanting to experience that anytime I'm sitting in a plane waiting in the lobby with the headset on, right? You know, being able to have that kind of magic at, at the moment's notice. It couldn't just be eyes and ears. It really had to have the hands fully in it. Um, so this is 2014. Um, at that point in time, you know, uh, we, you know, continued to work on Contact CI as like a Syracuse University startup. You know, we won a couple of competitions in, that, again, from the prototypes that were built while there for entrepreneurship and engineering during that senior year. And we decided fifteen thousand dollars in school grant money was enough to tell our parents we have we have what we're doing. You know, we're going forward and one hundred percent doing this. We're not. Uh, we're not pursuing jobs anymore. And, you know, really that's all we've ever done ever since. Um, by that, I mean, me and Tom, uh, Tim has been a, you know, uh, advisor and board member of the company the whole time ever since. Um, but when we left school in May of 15, Tom and I have pursued every single day, how do we make sure that we can extend the hand sense of touch into to VR and AR so that, you know, we have that full three sense platform. Um, through that, you know, the core innovation that's allowed us to really to do that. And if I, you know, mentioned, right, remember Tim and Tom talking about, there's a way to get that finger in it. Um, mm -hmm. It came around our exotendent principle. Um, and this is really like what bore all the way together of like spending, you know, what since 2014 now to 2023, every single day thinking about it is that philosophy of we need multi-force and ergonomic haptics to truly extend the hand all the way out. Um, so the process has been really that exotendent allowed us to see that that idea instead of moving from the exoskeleton, but instead, how do we have that modal that is more focused on, you know, the way your forearm itself biomedically pulls grip back on your fingers and, and continues to actually, you know, give you a restriction from the way that you've been doing most of your natural, you know, ergonomic human factor movements throughout life. Um, so I guess that's really been the journey, if you will, um, from childhood through why we call it multi-force ergonomics. Thank you so much, Craig. So it's very interesting because my next question would have been what inspired you to co-found Contact CI, but let me see if I heard correctly. I think I answered it. <laughs> it's a mix of magic roller coasters church and space which to me are like the four traf almost the trifecta of magical experiences and trying to make other people feel like that in absolutely your work. and Very i well absolutely love that. yeah no i i don't think i would have ever been able to figure that out on my own like the, the but yes that is i definitely you're correct like it's really one of the you know, make sure that we we get that feeling and have our hands on in that environment the whole time right i it's love that there, seeing it Thank you so much. So what specific goals or aspiration did you have in mind when you started the company? Was it really just what we just said, like allowing others to feel that feeling or is there something else? Yeah, I mean, I, I genuinely believe that um, if you look at each time that there's been a computing platform change, there has been an input modality that has unlocked a lot of that. Right. So in terms of, you know, we can look at the touchscreen for the smartphone, right? You know, uh, that being the fact that that really allowed us, okay, this level of mobile is able to happen, even though BlackBerry and others were, had mm -hmm. been existing for a while, even all the way back to like pagers giving you communication levels with you know, some sort of smart technology, if you will, just giving you a, a location. Um, there's the like VR itself needed to have that type of modality to also make spatial truly you know, possible. Um, you know, laptops had the, the touchpad that enabled it. 
Um, you know, gaming had the game, you know, gamepad itself, you know, rather than being in a joystick from your know, pong, you know, each things like that, that, that really take it to that, that step function. Um, that was a big part of it, but, you know, it, it really did come back down to like, you know, how does each person, you know, interact from the fact when they come out uh, daily and if we're going to call a computing platform spatial, they need to, you know, really be out interacting that same daily method is really the, the long-term inspiration. I know that, you know, getting there is not going to be, you know, a hundred percent realism all the way through. I mean, I thinking just back to like some of what Danny Grant was talking about in the last episode is, you know, yeah. they're part of the inspiration is also that you don't have to simulate every single force to get us there. Like the, that our brains have a, a learning model they've picked up where like, if I'm gripping my water bottle, I'm not, I'm not trying to like grip it as hard as I can. I don't need to always be getting my entire force. I need to dub just enough to let me know, okay, it's there. And also I can feel the nuances of the water shifting through which finger has more pressure now, which one has more friction on it. Like the, the inspiration really came from like, how do we focus in a nuanced way on getting there, but not in a way that's like over-engineering the amount of right. force we're doing, but actually thinking about what is the hand. And most of the time when people try to do everything, it creates some weird and eerie experiences that are not as realistic as real life, which our brain is magical enough and smart enough. So thank you for that. Uh, could you give us maybe an overview of the key achievements that and like the milestone that Contact CI has reached since its inception? Yeah, uh, no, that's fair. Um, I would say at CES this past year, we we launched a, a new version of our glove, which you know got one of them right here. Um, it's called Maestro EP. Um, I think one of the you know big milestones that we've reached is in a glove that's just this small that I'm able to put on you know this quickly here, you know, less than a pound. And, and that looks cool. You know, for those uh, that are not, you know, watching the YouTube version, you got to see that. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. It's a, the, you know, it's a, it feels like you have less than a pound device on your hand, but we're still able to give you a completely compelling multimodal, you know, interaction here without, you know, impeding my ability. I don't need anything else besides here. I can have, you know, this in a small backpack form factor. It can become a full mobile standalone device that, that works throughout, but it also has the ability to have a high enough resolution of force that when you're at the highest end of, of interactions where say something we've done with the U S air force, um, we you know, built very nuanced switches that in the past, you know, a dial, you know, on a, a mock cockpit to be able to train your hands out, you know, uh, costs quite a bit in materials or it costs quite a bit in time or safety to put someone in an actual plane to be training on it. Um, to begin able to get a glove that has enough fidelity to be able to have a hundred percent of pilots in a, in a specific cohort of, of training that came back as, satisfied or very satisfied as these being their realistic switches. And again, these are all pilots who's won more than 200 hours, you know, in these planes themselves. So these, they, they know all the muscle memory of the association there um, to be able to have something that to them, you know, felt like real switches while also being a lightweight device. They weren't plugged into anywhere else. They can move it around, take it to their home, uh, take it to their dorm, keep, have it on base in a, in a set. That's one of the big achievements that I feel like we've been able to do so far. You know, it, it truly is a compelling device that gives us that first step of being able to prove out, okay, how how do we how can we add more of this multi-force in an ergonomic way? So it's that that first placement there. Um, I think something else that I consider like an achievement of ours that we've done is um, looking at the fact that for many people, the rightfully gaming was the the, the first end all uh, be all uh, application. Right. You, you, you heard my background, right? Ashley knows it well. Um, you know, I I am a gamer as well. I'm like, that's where I'm, I want the experiences to get to. But I also see that PC computers got into our homes. I mean, personal computers got into our homes, right? From mostly being introduced to people at work first. That's where they got comfortability with it from whether it's something like an inventory software or your punch clock or whether it was your accounting firm doing payroll or whatever it was. That was then where you know that start bringing it home to your normal everyday functions as well. From for a long time, we've been pushing that training and up like the Air Force side of it or other productivity applications where your hands are truly necessary for again those feasibility concerns, the material concerns, the cost as a whole. Um, that area of VR is something we've been you know pushing and looking at for a long time. And the fact that like everyone is really caught up now to being like that's that's really a necessary portion of VR going after, I think is something we're really happy to see that that's like a development or achievement right. that's continued. Um, I guess that was a little bit long-winded to get to their apologies, but... The, no, no, no. Uh, I, lo I love your your answer because you you actually go in depth, which is a lot of feedback that we're getting from our audience. So thank you for actually providing more details. 
Yeah. Um, actually, yeah. we're going to go right into the area of expertise right now, which is my interesting part of the middle side of our podcast. So I'm going to go ahead back to Ashley for the next question. Awesome. Well, yeah. One quick thing I want to add also, also real quickly, yeah. I'll do it quickly. Yeah. Is uh, we, we noticed early on that you know, we were building both a motion tracking and a haptic device. I think, you know, we've we've really honed in on focusing on the, the platform being just haptic itself and plugging in with the other hand tracking that's out there, whether it's, you know, the Ultra Leap or whether it's the Oculus or whether it's, you know, looking at other things that are coming out and continuing down or, or even like the index knuckles cap sensitive, being able to unlock where the user is on their hand tracking with haptics that are already compelling. I think that's something that we've been able to really achieve that outside wasn't there before. You know, it's something yeah. that you needed to, to really replace the entire interaction stack. Um, but that's something we want to continue, obviously continue to get better on. And, you know, um, that's still a milestone for the industry as a whole. So that's actually something that now people can look up to and be like, yes, we have that. We can get further, but this was important to have. Exactly. Stepping stones. We're on our way. We're on our way. Absolutely. And, and for folks who just to dive deeper into the technology, for folks that may um, not have a chance to try haptic gloves, what I want to do is just get you to kind of walk through the feeling because it's like haptics is obviously something you need to try. It's one of those things, but it'd be great if you can kind of describe the experience, maybe like one of the use cases. Um, so someone can like really wrap their head around like what's happening and why it's kind of critical. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so within our glove, you know, one of the things that I guess is something we consider achievement as well is it's not obvious what's going to be happening. Like, it looks like there's really nothing going on here. Um, you know, that's, again, the goal is it's, it's able to fill up, be, be that way. But what, what you have is that exotenant I mentioned. Um, it, it's attached back here to the forearm unit, uh, runs and anchors you know, somewhere at the end of your finger so that similar to your real life, you know, tendon, the, it gets a pullback on it or a, a restriction that happens to, to give you a tension force happening. Um, so if, like if you, you know, right now, if you tap on your desk, you know, you're, you get a little bit of a external pushback force, but also a lot of that is a tightening that happens in your fingers. So going from like loose to, to tight, that's, that's a lot of what the, the device that's within the glove itself that, that again, we call that exotendon is trying to do is give you that, that tightening feeling. So if, uh, let's just go again, keeping things that are on my desk for pickup here, you know, like if you're if you're doing something where you want to test, like you know, that it has that push down level here. Right now, you know, in the device, you're gonna get a, a grip from telling you how much force is around the rigid body of the object. But then you can also, because it's a dynamic level of exotended force, be able to, okay, I've got my rigid body here, but now maybe what is an extra amount of force to then push through and now feel like that second level of that secondary effect of what's happening now from this me mechanism that is also in my hand. Um, that's part of what we say the multi-force portion of it is really important. Um, there's the also inside the device, not just the exotendon making that possible, but um, a vibrotactile fingertip cap, you know, as many on this call are, are definitely familiar with, you know, it has an LRA motor in it. We've looked at different routes, you know, mostly that's on cost efficiency of keeping the cogs down and right now, but, um, you know, getting at, you know, a, a higher bandwidth, higher frequency, higher nuanced level of control inside that fingertip gives us the ability to do things again like that that dial I was talking about. You know, if you're gripping onto it, you know, you have that force feedback telling you there. But we're talking about the secondary effect now being when you've turned it. If you think about, say, like your school locker back in the day, right? When you felt that that twist that you turned through on that dial, that moment that it clicked into place, that's a mechanical feedback that's happening on the other side of the device. The vibration is where we then now allow you to, if you've already got the force feedback giving you the pinch, not giving you the not using vibration to be your first point of contact telling you that you're holding it, but you've got that tangible restriction. As you turn, you can use the vibration to be that secondary feedback saying it's clicked and you can do it as you go through. Or you can, uh, if we're back in that cockpit, we're talking about the muscle memory use case of it being so that you don't have to have uh, an instructor you know, over top of you telling you, hey, you need to get used to this is the sequence of turning on this switch to this switch to that switch to this switch to that switch to this switch to be able to know if you have the fuel properly to even be able to take off. Right. That that each of those sequences is something that they spend hours in and process with right now. Um, and being able to build that muscle memory in a situation where uh, you don't have, you know, all the cost of building up uh, a C-130, a C-17, uh, an F-22, an F-15, and, you know, an A-10, every single cockpit across with having those materials then also being able to be integrated into their own interaction or have interpolate with the, the simulation itself. Um, being able to have that all be digital now where you can build that muscle memory use case um, is how we want the, 
you know, that multimodal of you know, you're feeling it from the tendon and the vibration blending in to give you that, that true tangible tactile. I, I know what I did in that interaction. I can repeat it when I'm actually in that real world scenario now, getting prepared and uh, prep from having felt it already. I love that. That's that's a really great explanation. You can kind of like wrap your head around the feeling, especially the locker experience. I think we can that all resonates with us. Anyone who even plays the um, is playing Hogwarts and uh, unlocking those quizzes. Yes, very yes, cool. Right, absolutely. <laughs> um, I mean, another way to think about the like amount of experience that you're feeling is we're not going to be doing anywhere close to 100 percent of anyone's grip strength right now. We we do have a a, a tolerance of of what we've ta- tapered that to, if you will. Um, but it is a, you like take your own finger right now and kind of pull back on it while trying to grip through it, right? That that tension you feel there, now with just a virtual block being part of that. And then add vibro tactile nuances, you know, that's about as detailed as we can get to right now. But hey, if you're going to be at AWE, we'll be there. You know, demoing is one of the next opportunities that we can you know, put on, let you you know, try it out. Because um, as as you said, Ashley, it's it's not a uh, a thing you can truly explain, but we tried to do that quite a bit. That's been one of the biggest challenges between now and 2014. <laughs> That's awesome. And I'm curious, like if we look at it at a high level of the industry, so you're in kind of across different spaces, XR, VR, um, telerobotics. Can you tell us about kind of the importance of haptic gloves within those specific kind of verticals? You've mentioned like um, military training that makes a lot of sense. What are some of the other areas that people can kind of wrap their head around for um, haptic gloves? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'll start at the the farthest, you know, reaching future right now, but, you know, maybe closer than a lot of people know, as, as you guys know from having just have the Anna the Avatar Prize, you know, winning team on in a recent you know, talk, the, the extension of your hand on the telerobotic side. Um, if let's say the think back to lockdown period of time when hands on skill workers were not really able to participate in this, you know, step away from you know day to day life, but still be able to use their their learned skills, their day to day job, you know, right there on the site. Um, if you have a a robotic, you know, arm that also is, you know, got enough movement through an avatar to also now allow someone, say, a mechanic, be at their home while also changing the oil on a car that came to the shop that has it knows that okay, this is where I'm supposed to come to get my shop, but you're still having the interaction that's happening there. Being able to make the the hand skills workers of the world be able to not be forced to, to have to be on site for everything that has, of course, a number of principles even closer flung today, like. Uh, if you're a chip manufacturer and you have a uh, repair needed on your on your fab, that's millions of dollars a minute basically happening while it's down. Currently, the process is, uh, let's say if your engineer that needs to do the repair is in Boston and your fab is in Shenzhen, right? You're getting on that flight, spending multiple hours, having those multiple minutes of cost going down. Having the, the robotic you know, hand that has a full sense of touch to be able to actually do that repair on site where you can log in through your haptic gloves, your your VR uh, headset and control that there. Now you're able to, again, extend the hand in a way that you can use that skill across the world and not have to have that same time travel to happen. So basically teleporting through robots, right? I would even add to that, that not just the the flight to, you know, remote location on the world, but even beyond in the future, once we get less latency, you might be working on the space station or completely alien planet who knows right and even on earth there are so many like dangerous spaces like nuclear plant or areas that are like super arid or extremely cold so being able to save these people like the digital twin basically of hapticality Mm -hmm. i love what you're explaining right now craig absolutely i mean like one of the ones that was in the college thesis that uh, we looked at at the time back you know again syracuse was um bomb disposal units Right, they use a, a two degree of freedom hand, uh, the highest you know accuracy ones. Then shoot a laser through it and take care of it. That still does ninety nine percent, but there's that one percent of you know the laser failure that the actual hand skill does not have. We have a hundred percent you know failure rate. I mean non failure rate on bomb disposal with hand skills. So another like, ex- moving the human away from the safety concern, but still having that true transferability of their skills because it's. It's locked up in their brain's sense of touch, right? It's not something that they can have that phantom grasp and go forward. Of course, you want to get to being able to do like robotic surgeries and things like that, where you know that's you know that that highest level of nuance. We're going to need more multiple modals, you know, actuation into it to be able to get there. Um, but some there are many other, layers before that. Yes, exactly, exactly. And and kind of stepping down of, of why we focused more on VR and AR ourselves is that. There are some of the sensors and some of the the dexterity of the hands that still need to come together on the robotic side. There's some great stuff happening. You know, 
I would like maybe shout out Touch Labs or, or Syntouch as two of the, the sensors on the end of the fingertips that are really great. Um, the so VR AR node doesn't necessarily have that because you're extending your hand into the avatar's hand, right? Um, but there's so many other applications where if we just go back to wanting to flick that pencil and feel that magic of that experience of you know being Buzz Aldrin going to space, um, you know having my hands there unlocks that. But also you know being at the point where let's say you're a car manufacturer today, you are using a scalpel and clay to to draw the new headlights for you know the the upcoming Ferrari. I don't know. Um, and uh, the within that, you have a lot of material use. You have a lot of cost and concern to be able to do yourself through that hand skill. If we can make some of that material use become virtual, but you're still, again, you're being the artist that has your scalpel hand skill, having the full transfer of feeling, that secondary effect of the tool getting pushed back because it has multiple ergonomic forces that allow you to be going through it. That's where we see VR has the you know, haptic gloves unlock a quite a bit in the workspace. That isn't just a training, right? Um, if it's, you know, being able to be a spot where you know, right now, you know, if we end this call with being able to handshake and high five each other and feel more human just from that, right. Um, there, that, that being connection part of it as well is where some of the AR VR comes into it. Um, if you are looking at just on the AR side, things like, uh, you know, not having phantom interactions. So you're not eliminating the one sense that you've had in every single interaction your whole life for going through a, um, like a manual of repair at this, you know, like a, let's say your production facility for shampoo, uh, you know, this is something that's you know actively being used out there in the world, you know, where, you know, you have the the HoloLens giving you the overlay of here's the next part that I need to repair, things like that. Right now, you're still having full phantom grasp of interacting through that. The haptics being added to that gives you the ability to properly manipulate quicker. I'll use an example of one of our early case studies in uh, the medical side of VR. So uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, they had uh, an application where basically you're designing a custom piece for each pediatric surgery you need to do because you know there's the, that part doesn't exist. They have to adopt the the human the the adult piece for the child you know growth state. Um, before they were doing a CAD experience on a 2D screen, the doctor and the engineer were spending at least 15 hours for each case to go through. Okay, uh, can you take that part out? Can you, you know looking at the, the scans going back and forth. When they went to VR, you know, they cut that into being about a 10 hours, you know, roughly ish uh, interaction. The biggest complaint from each of the surgeons was still not feeling like they're they having to learn a new interaction state because they were just using hand tracking and not able to just you know grip on the object as if they're sitting at their own table, putting the things together as if it was a 3D model. Right. Um, so we you know did an integration for them, showed them. OK, a very early version of the, the maestro haptics of our you know, interactions being put into that. Could that speed up your ability? And, and the, the feedback was phenomenal from that partnership. Uh, we didn't you know, publish any official case study on data I can you know, share on that. But from them speeding up the application process of being able to actually now design back to like they were when they were in the real lab and not having to have two people's times cutting it from that 15 hours on the CAD you know, 2D screen to now using your real life hands to being let's say a third of that time, you know, to, to prep for these and, you know, and that's efficiency that's really matters to, to people being back to being, being like human when they're interacting digitally. We have um, those so examples right of... here. Haptics saves life, time, and the ecology by also reducing traveling, which, you know, any tech trying to prove those points are having a hard time. And now we have great examples of this. So thank you. Back to you, Ash. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I want to dive. You're kind of touching upon the business of um, haptics. And I think, you know, notoriously hardware is hard. I'd love for you to share some of your insights as a hardware company for other companies that um, are just like trying to broach it. They're maybe even like in academia thinking about taking that step or they're just like um, a few folks who are getting together and they're like, we have this vision of the future and we really want to bring it to life. Like, what are your insights that you can share from the hardware side of like how to surmount um, just all the challenges that you face yeah um i wish i had a a silver bullet answer um, that i could share you know um the i'll definitely say like everything in entrepreneurship you know how how one group survives is not always the easiest way for, or the right way to pattern match for someone else to survive you know if you will um it's that things are like very dependent but i will also say that perseverance is is required in a lot of ways especially with the hardware aspect of it um, in today's world, right, with most things being, you know, bits, the, the 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 feedback loop of like how quickly you can change things, how much you need to put into the the timing, the preparation of it, 
thinking through like the iteration cycles of the hardware is just a different thought process for a lot. So, you know, making sure that you do that or include that in your, your budgeting and your timeline of adoptions or how long it's going to take to, to make a change. If you do put something in, you know, that like keeping that in mind at all times, perseverance and endurance of that timeline is necessary, you know, compared to like the bits iteration cycle. Um, I would say even like, that's kind of what Danny Grant pointed out a little bit in last episode, right? Uh, there's, a need for even like when you looked at the dual shock, I mean, dual sense versus dual shock, right? How the, what is the threshold for truly proving there's value and there's better? And like, while you might see it in like a, a prototype experience, now how many layers have to be added for that end user to actually understand it? You know, and what do you need to kind of make sure that like, okay, even though you see that, like, you know, the first time I touched a block inside of VR using the X attendant, like I didn't have any, any motion tracking. I didn't have any ability to move my arm around and have any ability. I could, I had to line my arm up to where I had it in the space, you know, put my, and then, and then I I could make the glove like match up to it. And I I was like, that was enough to to prove it to me. Right. But to to proving it to your end users and showing the value like that, what is the full layer, you know, it takes a lot of endurance to figure out each of those spots and also to like work through that each stage of one person might say yes, but is the next person also going to say yes. That is like the, the internal champion has their their boss they also have to push, you know, if you will, from that end, right? Um, and I think that's a lot of A to D answer to it, if you will. Um, but uh, um, the looking at how can you also, like, prototype things as cheaply as possible and then commit when necessary, like, is, is, is one of the things that I would say, like, Tom has really championed and, and helped learning from our team, you know, uh, and the group as a whole that has done most of the, the hardware and the product work from our group. Um, I'll also say one of the things, the lessons we've taken from some of our advisors and some of the things that we've seen in the adoption as a whole is building where even if the economies of scale right now are a little bit expensive, you know, lining yourself up to where if it goes to mass, it has the ability to easily plug into those economy of scale factors and becoming you know, like, for example, one of the, the actuators that we're using with it, it might be a little bit expensive for us to be buying it at the scale we're doing and shipping right now. But it's very easy to show that, like, at the scale of Quest headset shipping, it becomes not nothing to the cog. So keeping that in mind uh, um, has been helpful. Um, part of it for us is also we've we we know that we're in the DK2 era of, of the haptics, if you will, right now. Um, and that it's not a, a fully solved product. There's going to be you know, the pancake lenses are are far away from being even, exi- you know, added to the product, right? Or uh, there's like, you know, you don't have any room scale added to the headset yet. There's still those things that are, you know, going to be coming, but it is worth it to get it to end users' hands and getting up that traction point and that proof point to kind of help create some of the wave. For a while, we were we were thinking that, you know, the moon will create all the wave, right? You know, sometimes you have to you have to get the, the servers out there so other people know, hey, the, there is a wave created by the moon to be going on it, right? The, the distribution that, you know, I think you... You two, Manny, and Ashley know very well from what you guys have been doing from this, right? Um, you know that that aspect of being willing to to get the the device into people's hands is also necessary. But knowing that there's still stuff to come, so we're not over committed into like how we can produce things right now for what we add in from the the roadmap coming down the line. If that Thanks so sense. much. Yeah, absolutely. I think you shared a lot of like the different levels of it. So it's like the importance of just like actually trying it dog fooding your own technology, but not being the person who decides like, this is cool for me. So like, let's do the, I'm all in. Um, so testing it, having like a really great uh, group of advisors, um, having people who can help you with making the decisions of like how to cut costs, where to cut costs um, and making sure that you can, if you see a vision, making sure that you can sustain yourself to get to that vision seems uh, pretty critical. I also yeah, want I to ask a question. I go around and distill my nonsense <laughs> all the time. Like, you guys are <laughs> it so well. Like, <laughs> this is awesome. You're dropping bars, but I do want to kind of put you under the spotlight um, because for me, you are one of the most enthusiastic, passionate, um, dedicated just vibrant CEOs I've ever met, haptics or otherwise. But I'd love for you to share just like how you kind of keep this energy and enthusiasm for, you know, waking up every day and doing kick-ass things. Um, that's too kind, genuinely. I, I, I appreciate that. But uh, I, I'm, I stay optimistic for because it, I, the progress is very tangible to me. It's, 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 it's there. It's obvious. Um, 
like, you know, from the standpoint of if we thought about the DK2 era, right, compared to the fact that we can say shipping units that the quality and at Quest, right, and have that be our metric, right? It's like uh, the real landmark milestone groups are there and the progress is, you know, clearly on the way. You can touch it. Yes, abs- <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's, I can feel it. I can feel it. <laughs> um, secondly, it's, it's genuinely, I don't mean to be corny, it's been the team that we've been working with here at Contact. I mean, from John Schroeder to, to Zach Schroeder to Tom Buchanan to um, I think Alex Malin is here on the call right now to Christina Sue to uh, Athena to Graham to Brant to to the you know um, if we go back to Darren uh, you know the axiom is from some of the first people to even give us hope to you know the lots of you know shout out Dave and Dave who were two of the first people to ever be some of our advisors different like people that have been able to to show us like they believe in it has been. I don't know. It's it's just really a, a nice fuel for me individually, and like you know, like seeing how everyone has you know been worked on as a whole. It's not been an individual effort in any type of way. Like um, that has, I don't know, just always been a, a, a very like thrilling and fueling thing for me. Um, part of it comes back to it's just a childhood dream, right? It's very easy to be excited about you know the amusement park not being in my backyard anymore, but being in my backpack, right? Uh, and and being able to. All right, I'm going to quote this and put this on a shirt. <laughs> Fair, good deal. Run with it. I, I, I'll buy it from the, the Haptics Club merch store. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, I mean, and also just there's been awesome, amazing people in the community every single day like that are, like, are working and developing. It's coming apart. Also, just there's very few times in humanity that I think there are truly transformational things that you get to be a part of. And, you know, being able to make an impact on that is something that I, I I would be more upset with myself for not trying to be to be happy about working on that every day than not, you know. And I think about each things we've talked about through here, right? That truly haptics are something that can, if actually extending the hand, sense of touch, sense of touch happens in a in a compelling way. Uh, I think humanity gets transformed in a significant way that 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 I would I would love to be a part of that journey, if you will. So it's easy to stay happy and motivated about that. If that makes sense. Yeah. Sorry, it's just you're making me emotional. That's uh, that's honestly just beautiful. I appreciate you sharing that. Just being so open um, and kind of pouring your heart out. Um, absolutely brilliant. I want to move on to our kind of final section. My favorite part. I'm very curious to hear what you have to say about this. The future of haptics. I'm going to hand it to you, Manu. Thanks, Ashley. And and just before we go in, uh, I just wanted to say thanks to Greg also for your last answer was super important because people like us and what you're doing, um, the world needs it. You're good at it, but you're also excited about it and it feels. And it's really nice to see, not just because you have the CEO title, but you're also just coming from a childhood dream. Like that's the type of thing that gets me going personally. And so like seeing youth thrive, I think influences all of us too, even in different areas. So Thank you, first of all. Second, in your opinion, I can't wait to hear your answer on this. What are some of the most exciting advancements or developments we can expect to see in like the field of haptics in the near future? And you can frame it around five to 10 years if you want. Okay. Um, starting with the, the five to 10 year frame, I think one that's pretty relevant right now with the what's happened in the last six months in the um, you know, the AI and the the learning module space, if you, you know, um, is I think we'll get to a point where it's not going to need to be as manual and and as design intensive for us to get to a point where we have a haptic profile for something, right? I think we're going to get to a point where we have a an AI model that is able to in real time say, okay, this is how much you know physics force you are adding to you know your hand added to the to the cap and how much you're going to want to twist it out. So I should I should push back against you at this amount of pace and give you this you know and building off of that and that not necessarily have to be something that's intensively designed you know um, is something that that is coming which means I think we're going to get a higher set of like I'm in terms of designing each rich haptic profile of like you know if there's 15 data points that are happening right here at the very end of my tip we can't nobody can be doing that with any of our actuation modalities right now but getting to a point where if the software itself knows how to blend those a little bit better because it's learned from, you know, what's out there in every single profile, we're going to get to a much, much more richer set of haptic shaders, if you will, is a word that we, you know, I, I know they don't like me using internally here on the team, but I, I continue to. Um, and um, the other aspect of where, we, where, where we're going, and I think it's going to definitely be a lot closer and come together, is it's 
it's not going to be a one takes all market. I think one way to also look at it is the way that computing platforms have grown is I'm still on my computer, you know, my PC desktop right now with you guys, and I'm going to take emails and calls and Spotify from my cell phone. And then I'm going to get on my headset and you know, play some walkabout VR with the team actually in our, in our VR hangout later this afternoon. Like, you know, they're each mode of those visual headsets have all, you know, I mean, visual computing platforms have all kind of blended in ways together. I, I think that haptics are going to be getting to a point where there's is a higher understanding of the fact that it doesn't have to be an end all be all of it, it being on or, or off at all times, right? I think the dual shock can show you that sometimes it's better to have it and something when it's in a nuanced and in a, in a well designed place. The software that I was talking about, you know, designers and the tools that we're getting to even before that will unlock a lot, right? But we're looking at five to 10 years. So um, saying that, you know, the software that's more nuanced from learning from the, the overall multimodal, multi force blending in, but also now being in a standpoint where you're not required to just turn it being at one or off, but also thinking about what is the application use case that's better for this device that's in a wearable, this device that's in a handheld, this device that's in a single finger, this device that's in, um, you know, getting to where there's lots of SKUs on that as a whole. I, I guess the, the it's a long way of saying that I, I genuinely think in five to 10 years, we will be in a high def haptics era. You know, if right mm -hmm. now we are in a black and white, you know, screen, we haven't even gotten to color screen, you know, is where we're at right now. I think within three years, we're very, very much, we're on a, we're in a color screen standard definition, you know, watching that, that blessy, that, that fuzzy, you know, nineties, you know, basketball and football that I grew up on. Uh, but, you know, we're within five to 10 years in a spot where you truly have a, a high standard definition uh, level of haptics that are able to be interacted in all types of spatial computing interactions. Love that. Thank you. That's a perfect segue for my next one. So you've mentioned, you know, earlier the three sense immersive platform, which is also on your website. Um, how do you envision haptic tech involving and integrating with emerging tech such as AI? So you touch a little bit on that XR, IoT or wearable device or all together. Yeah, um, I think one way we can talk about it is uh, if you want to go IoT, smart home you know, situation and things like that. Right. Uh, Plus, you know, what I'm doing is my mobile platform and, and working in together. My Your Apple Watch today, um, it's one of the like consumer haptics that I enjoy the most because it made it socially acceptable for me to check, like, is that a is that a text message? Is that an email notification I need to know, I need to be looking at? Versus, like, if I get the buzz in my pocket and I'm pulling it out, right, and I'm now, me and my distraction levels, I'm, I'm now, like, into this rather than, you know, into our call currently, right? But I can glance right here. Now, if we're taking that to the point of, I'm out in my backyard and I have my IoT attached to my watch at well, and it can tell me that, boom, your microwave or your toaster strudel in the in the toaster is done as well. You know, you can go back inside and get that rather than me being like, with my you know neurodivergent state that can get in a very quick you know time time lapse. Right, I can I could easily forget about the fact that I can put that toaster strudel in because I'm out in my backyard doing something there. Right, and having that second set of information in some way that is overlaying. Right. That's in just my regular world. But then also now if we're taking it to where you're in your virtual world where you're able to be feeling things that are you know not there from a, a feel the unreal object standpoint, but also getting you know that same notification from, oh, my, my buddy just rang my doorbell. It's okay like because my watch is also connected here and I've got a different set of a, a rich enough haptic that I can tell that difference from that, right? That I can tell that like, hey, that's a real world secondary effect that's telling me to, to go in and check in on that. Uh, I see that's something that's definitely coming together. If you will talk about like where the long-term blending of all the platforms can can come from, um, but I also see it as looking at where that is already clearly happening. It's you know the people are starting to understand that more. That's not something that's necessary to be just a VR and AR thing, right? I think right. That's you know th those will blend together as we get there, you know. But I think it's good that we're doing more and more in the real world today, with even people not knowing that they're necessarily using yeah. haptics or the three sense rather than just visual and audio. I think Ashley, you tweeted about it saying, you know, you don't use a ringtone, right? You know, so that's the same thing, right? That was probably the first major, you know, wave of that change is yeah. vibration being how we know we got a call rather than ever always hearing a ping, ping. I love those answers because you 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 touch on the general theme, I think, which is the societal evolution while the tech evolves. Because obviously you could go as fast as you can, but if the society don't adapt to those evolving mechanisms, then it doesn't mean anything. And you give two examples. The ringtone with what Ash tweeted and the, you know, the smartwatch vibration pattern, which I think is very interesting because it's very subtle. We don't have a moment where we say before, after it just, just happened. 
like being okay having earbuds in your earplugs. I remember the first time I have my AirPods, I only put one in the left ear because I felt dumb having both. And now it's almost a social status hierarchy level to have earplugs and not have the cable anymore. So like we will see these things, I think, and, and you're really right on that uh, in the coming years and, and seeing those kind of convergence of tech happening is very exciting to me. So is there any specific challenges or barriers uh, that need to be overcome to haptic tech to reach its full potential? And what steps are being taken by Contact CI uh, or the industry as a whole to address them? Yeah, um, well, I guess I'll plug every other episode of this, this podcast and, and answering <laughs> that question. On uh, There's a lot of problems and, and, and challenges to go forward on that still. Um, I think one that uniquely we're working on here at Contact CI is the, uh, I guess, one step back before the word uniquely here. Uh, as like again, one of, one of the people I respect the most in the industry, Danny pointed out, you know that it is a multimodal, right? It is like I mean, a, a multi skill set needed. It is a multi, like uh, it's not just one fat problem being solved. For, it's isolated area, um, but that you know it's a combinations of of skill sets and problem solves coming together and from areas that maybe didn't come from before. Uh, like uh, I shouted out Christine and Athena, two members of our team on the product side here at uh, Contact. They come from uh, actually a fashion design and uh, academic and professionally, you know, where they're, that's where most of their careers have been. Some spent some time in different tech and wearable things as well. Don't mean to under undermine that the work they've done there, but um, and foundationally, both of them have come from the fashion design side of it because they're as a wearable tech that is also going to be on your hand that's going to be a part of trying to change a societal. Are you okay with this being there? You have to think about how comfortable is it going to be for each person, or, or is it going to be something where you're going to have fatigue while wearing it, or is it going to consider cool to wear it? Like, you know, there's a reason why like Oakley can have outlandish looking sunglasses that because they have a cool fashion design leading brand that also makes people have value attached to the, the extreme sports aspect of it. And things like, you know, uh, if, if someone else tried to put out those same, you know, you know, wave runners, it wouldn't work, right? You know, so there's that part of it, like of like, you know, like building both the brand portion of like how it's okay to solve these, but also having the skill set and knowledge to be willing to act on. Here's a new different background that's necessary to change that problem. So for us, like the glove has to have a fashion component to it, but also a fit and wear component of a soft goods, not just a fashion component to it, but like how do you how does the actuation properly get onto your hand in a way that doesn't Again, we use ergonomic because it doesn't impede or restrict you from being able to talk with your hands like I do and you do, Manny, right? And like being here to like use our gestures that help us get through things and being there. If I don't, if I want to just be able to do this in VR, this is a non-haptic experience at all. My haptics can't stop me from being able to do this while I'm talking inside VR chat because of I'm, I'm excited to have the haptic there when I'm shaking your hand, right? It has to blend in the same way your skin does there, like right now, you know, is the easiest way to put it. Um, so that that wearable aspect of it and how you are, where you're putting it, how you're keeping in the same spot, how you're staying consistent with output. That's important. If we take continuing on the hand haptic specifically, no one's hand is one and the same. Every hand, whether it's, you know, dexterity levels, whether it's, you know, uh, amount of fingers, amount of, amount of fingers, uh, amount of grip strength that you have. Um, it, are my fingers longer compared to the way that my palm is compared to, you know, uh, all the, like that aspect of it. But we all have such a highly, highly detailed, nuanced way that our hand works built in our brain already. Um, so being able to be in that adjustment range of you're hitting that first point of how well does it fit? How does it, how is it seamless? How does it go on? How does it have no restriction to the user while also being able to have that wide range of fit, you know, what's out there? That's, I think, some of the biggest problems of, for us, you know, contact that we're trying to constantly always uh, uh, address. I mean, one kind of cheeky way that I sometimes like to, you know, answer that of like how we're also addressing it is, you know, Nike hasn't figured out how a shoe can work for everyone, right? Uh, and a one size shoe can fit for everyone. You know, if you're running in a track meet with a size 11 on while you're a size seven, it's just not going to work. It's not going to feel good. It's not going to perform. It's not going to be able to be optimally doing what's want. Now, if we're taking some of the nuance level where your hand, that thing doesn't exist and we're trying to make you feel that it's there, if you're having something that's too big or too small, it's just not going to be able to provide the proper amount of functionality, just like that track shoe will not allow you to run, you know, in a way that you could win the 400 meter, you know? Um, so that, that's part of the problem too, is getting to a point where like hardware is expensive. Is it, are people going to be comfortable with 
We need to have your own size glove. Or do we need to get to a point where we can have a one size fits most like a lids hat, right? You know, because they have figured that out, but they still offer the different sizes, right? Even though everyone's head's different. Exactly. You could still have a staple one while you offer more range on the side. Yeah. This is very great answer. And I want to touch back on a few points quickly because you really give, I think, what I also discovered during my time as a haptician's. A lot of the work I've I love done was on, around the haptic cuff. I also love that word. That's why I keep bringing it back because <laughs> it's magician and haptic together. Right. Uh, haptic. Basically designing haptics. Uh, but the work on the haptic cuff, the biggest thing that I started um, looking into was not the tech, was not the design, was not the UX. It was the wearable fashion side of things. Because if you're going to sell something around someone's bracelets or wrist, it has to be fashionable. That's that's the way the world works. And it's very interesting because you can go back to even ancient time where form was as important as function. And it's super interesting to, to see that you think that about that for the gloves, but not only for haptics in general. I think Apple hired like one of the biggest fashion director um, before starting on the Apple Watch. And that was super important for them because they knew it was important. And I'm pretty sure anyone working on, you know, AR glasses have the same type of thinking right now based Definitely. on the example you give about Oakley. So I mean, think so about Snap, so right? Think about like Snap, they, they, they partnered more with like, LA fashion brands than they did with Silicon Valley tech brands to, to right. launch, you know, the, the spectacles at first, right? We see it with Meta and Ray-Ban and so on. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Exactly. Very much so. You also yeah. mentioned a lot ergonomics in the past, which I just want to give a shout out because you, you really touch base on accessibility, which is super important. Like not everybody has the same size, not everybody has the same function. And we all suffer from different type of disabilities and Having that in mind as a CEO is super important as we got to more accessibility, inclusivity, diversity, because yes, there will be a stapled version of your product, but still being able to kind of think about the external side that are more minimalistic or precise on niche examples, like you said, like it doesn't have to be as precise as surgical for now, but you still want to get there at some point while still offering the perfect haptic handshake where we will get at some point. So. Yeah. Thank you again, Craig, for having us. And I'll let Ashley close up before we go into uh, our audience questions. Thank you, man. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. And but yeah, before I wrap things up entirely, Craig, I wanted to give you an opportunity to, to um, let people know where they should find more about you. Where should they look? Where can they learn more about Contact CI, what you guys are up to, and you know what uh, juicy stuff you're going to have out next? Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that. Um, this camera, the, this camera, this camera. <laughs> we're, we're, we're on all the, we're on the social channels, you know, at, Contact underscore CI. Um, uh, the CI is controller interfaces. So you know, just for anyone who's curious out there, that's what you know we have it standard for. Our website's contact.ci. You know, it's very simple on that end as well. Um, we will be at AWE is probably the next in-person event. So we'd love to, if you can reach out to any of our emails. I mean, I'm just Craig at contact.ci. Uh, I believe Alex is here on the call as well. He's alex.maland at contact.ci. So um, if you want to reach out to us over email, check out any of our socials, our website, or see us at AWE. We'd love to talk to you about, you know, how we can, you know, get your hands extended into VR if that's something you want to chat more about. Awesome. Yeah, it's a badass demo. I highly recommend AWE. I think it's coming up in like late May, early June, right? I think that's when it's dropping Santa Clara. So May be sure 31st, to do yeah. So exactly like one month from now, you know, we've got, we've got to be a little heads down on some stuff before that and now, but that'll be the next time that we'll, we'll have the gloves in person in public. Ooh, some heads down time. Okay. Okay. There's some juices of happening. All right. Well, yeah, we'll have to hear about it next time. <laughs> it will be a good chance that there's a, a different demo than what we did at C. I I mean, a upgraded demo experience than what we've done at CES, you know, depending on things. If you were one to, you know, recently saw the EP launch at CES, um, there's, We've, we've listened to the, some of the feedback and we're, we're very happy with some of the solves that we're hopefully you know, going to be able to share with some people at AWE, but we'll go from there. We'll, we'll, we'll talk to you all about that more in a month, I guess. Ooh, lovely. Love it. Awesome. Um, Craig, thank you so much for joining us. What an absolute pleasure. Great con for our, around haptic gloves, business of hardware, and of course, um, just uh, immersiveness, immersion, um, and love a good origin story. And yours was absolutely spectacular. So for anyone listening, of course, be sure to check out the hapticsclub.com. That's where you can find all the links to all the things that we do, including LinkedIn, we're on Twitter at Haptics Club. Um, our blog is live, as mentioned. So check out our blog. We've got a bunch of really cool articles on just... Um, Haptics 101. We've got all of our podcasts and transcription in case you want to listen to podcasts you want to read. By all means, check that out. It's some of your favorite hapticians are writing there. So check it out. And of course, if you want swag, 
by all means, we've got the store live from our website, hats, shirts, mugs, all those fun things. And of course, we're going to back back coming soon. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah, more shirts with epic quotes. Uh, thanks to Craig. Um, and of course, like you can listen to us on all the major uh, podcast platforms. We're on Spotify, we're on Apple, we're on YouTube. If you want to watch the video, Craig was showing some demos. So by all means, you'd be missing out if you didn't check that out. And of course, our sponsors, Haptics Industry Forum, um, check them out at Haptics If. Dot org. Thanks for sponsoring us. Thank you for supporting us. Um, and everyone who's listening, thank you for um, just all the kind words, um, all the support, listening in, um, just enjoying our episodes and and sharing them. We appreciate it. We love what we do because we love haptics. Um, it, we dedicate our time to this because it's a passion. It's a passion place. We believe the industry is uh, something really special and unique and that it's going um, an amazing direction that some people will expect. But generally, people have no idea, and it's going to be super hyped to see their offices. But till then, our next episode's coming up in two weeks. We will see you there. Bye.